Great to see everyone. Uh, this has been a really awesome workshop. Um, uh, I've been uh, super excited to see that uh, we've basically converged on a lot of the same ideas across the ecosystem. And so um, huge kudos to uh, just everyone here and you know many other people out there that um, kind of see where we are, um, see the gaps, see the needs, and so on. And we're kind of rallying to solve the problem. So uh, my original intention when uh, setting up the, this initial talk was to like talk a lot about the same things that has have been said in the talk already, which is which is great. Like I, I don't have to say those things anymore. Everybody else already said them. Uh, maybe it's good to like uh, acknowledge them in terms of common knowledge. Um, so what I thought instead to shift towards is to maybe talk about like where to go from here, how to go from where we are now, uh, point to a set of problems in um, to solve across different kinds of implementations, walk through you know, kind of a set of ideas of, of, of what may be viable, um, and then talk about how as a community we will uh, make this happen. Meaning, um, I think there's a lot of interest here to fix a bunch of these problems, but, but the, the kind of like trajectory or path from here to the future is, is a bit unclear. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is, is, is I'm gonna kind of like suggest a, few, a bunch of ideas uh, here and kind of uh, have this as a call to you know, kind of think about these possibilities and think of writing these new um, uh, types of implementations. Uh, and then, then I'm gonna kind of like finish with a, with a call to like come together at IPFS camp to then as a community, um, make a bunch of decisions of, of where to go. Meaning um, what should the protocol be and so on. Uh, that's like a, like, a, like a community oriented thing that we gotta get a lot of people in the, right, in, in the room to, um, to start discussing and start, start doing the, 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 both the cleanup of, of past specs and cleanup of past systems system ideas to then kind of craft a, craft a new direction. Um, so, you know, to think of like this entire workshop and the prior talks and this talk as like uh, surfacing a bunch of ideas of where to go and kind of like having a call to uh, come together at VFS Camp to, um, to, to work on them together. Uh, so I kind of want to start with a story uh, based on the web. So when the web, uh, as the web evolved, uh, you can see here this chart that shows kind of the distribution of different websites um, using different um, uh, types of servers. And you can see kind of, uh, even by 1995, there were a few different implementations, um, Apache being one of the uh, really key ones that kind of helped open up uh, the landscape of, uh, and, and help a lot of people write new implementations. And then uh, it, it took a while until um, we got like the, the later explosion of the web. Um, and kind of what I mean by that is that it took a while to mix the uh, client server model of HTTP with the computation um, that we know and love today in terms of these massive scale um, web services that uh, can blend the HTTP protocol and the whole HTML, JS, CSS stack um, with pages and APIs and so on. And uh, you know, another way of like looking at the story is like this. In in the in the beginning, there was kind of HTTPD, and uh, a lot of people ran HTTPD. Uh, then people started kind of like creating uh, patches of HTTPD, so uh, people started creating their own forks and their own versions, and started kind of writing different implementations. And it was kind of um, confusing which HTTPD version you were you were running, um, and so on. And then after that, uh, people started creating crafting these different implementations and naming them something else. Uh, like Apache 2 and IIS and uh, and so on. And that naming change really helped everybody talk about what implementation they were actually uh, running um, and that there could be trade-offs between between a lot of these implementations. Um, and there are a number of other implementations that got written around this time that, that were super, super useful. Around the same time, people started blending computation in with HTTP, mostly through external means, mostly by calling using an HTTP server to then call out to some other process through you know CGIBN and, and similar kind of kind of systems, uh, but the and, and then that kind of seeded the ground for a whole bunch of other frameworks uh, and, and web tools that um, then fleshed out the, the the explosion that came later, uh, and that that was when people stopped um, treating the 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 web server as a thing kind of on on its own. Uh, of course, this is still. Uh, how tons of web systems run at scale. Uh, but there's a huge transition when people started writing um, applications by embedding 
the HTTP server or client as a as a library in their application. And so, you know, things like the early Java work um, that kind of like accumulated a ton of like really good ideas to um, uh, I think Whiskey and 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 a bunch of other uh, and other different kinds of interfaces that enabled um, translation of this sort of stuff to then you know things like Django and PHP <clears throat> and many other uh, frameworks and tools that enabled blending the computation along with with the generation of the page and that eventually ultimately leading to you know things like Flask and and many other frameworks you know there are probably hundreds of of different tools um, and things like Node eventually that kind of really took this to the extreme where you suddenly had you were sort of composing the entire um, construction of the of the page and application as as a as a at, at runtime, and and that's really when the massive explosion of web adoption and, and web application development um, I think really happened. Like, and and going back to this graph, um, the, a lot of this adoption and so on has kind of gone down in terms of these big name uh, servers. Um, I think I don't know if this is what explains this gap in, in the graph, but, but my sense is that these days the vast majority of web applications are running on systems like these, where like you're embedding the uh, HTTP client and server as a um, uh, as a library in in your in your application. So let's go, you know, think about IPFS for a moment. Um, so in, in the beginning, there was sort of IPFS and JS IPFS, and the goal there was to kind of um, create this uh, landscape where you could have kind of the um, the larger scale. Um, distributed sense oriented implementation uh, with Go and so on. And then you could have like a, a web native implementation that could just run in directly in the browser. Um, over time, that led to a whole bunch of other different applications that embedded one of the one or another of these pieces or started taking some of these parts away. So things like Companion and Desktop and um, Go Mobile and IPFS Lite and so on. And, and a ton of other tools that have kind of um, either used parts of these implementations as a library. Um, or embedded one of them entirely, or or something like that, and kind of. Uh, but it's, they were still sort of uh, constrained by um, Go IPFS, JS IPFS, and the um, infamous like IPFS spec that is that is floating around. Uh, I think what's happened since then is that um, people have taken the the really useful parts of the of the systems and sort of exploded out IPFS into a larger scale network of systems that's basically about IPLD data moving around some transport. Uh, it could be the it could be just HTTP, it could be a bunch of other things. Um, and really kind of starting to build applications on top of the IPLD data directly. And I think one of the key things that we need to do in this moment is to actually rename Go IPFS and JS IPFS, and you know, I've been kind of pushing hard for this, uh, because right now people are still equating um, IPFS with the tool that you run in your command line that is called IPFS, uh, that you install in your computer and it's called IPFS and so on. And so we're kind of being held back by the fact that we're at this stage and we still have the, the tool named IPFS. Like kind of the, the web sort of did away with that uh, earlier. And I think we, um, we, we kind of have to do that so that we start recognizing all these other systems as full on implementations of IPFS um, and full on like systems that have their own trade-offs and their own design decisions and so on, um, but they can really like kind of um, uh, treat all of these different kinds of implementations as sort of class. And when people are thinking about um, what, what IPFS should do or, uh, or how to reason about content in IPFS and so on, um, the, the, the question becomes a lot more uh, nuanced depending on the specific implementation, the specific service or the specific deployment that you're talking about. Um, and, and so I think like one of the, the big shifts that we have to do is like um, open up the landscape of implementation and just make it like much easier for everybody to kind of um, treat all of these other systems as uh, as full on IPFS implementations. Um, and they might not all interrupt. And, and that's one of the hard questions that we're going to have to figure out hopefully at this at IPFS camp soon is like how to reason about um, data moving between all these different kinds of implementations. In many cases, it'll be difficult for some of these systems to uh, to interact. Uh, we, we've had a lot of this uh, happening in um, in in the Falcon network, which is one of the largest access deployments, um, where different tools and so on don't actually speak to each other yet, um, and so it's difficult to move around the data and whatnot. Uh, but I think one of the big uh, wins that we've seen over the last few uh, few months and you know, a couple of years, I guess, is a lot of services just moving around um, data directly through um, car files through 
um, other, other formats and learning to kind of read and write directly to those kind of intermediate um, bundles uh, and then building IPFS systems out of, out of that. Now, I think like what's gonna generate the big explosion here uh, and what we're sort of like um, uh, kind of like about to encounter uh, is IPFS and WASM. And there, there's one like I have many regrets in life. One of them, uh, which is a, big, a really big one, is that early in the IPFS paper, um, way back, when I was writing it, I was strongly considering putting VA directly into IPFS and just shipping IPFS the first version natively with a VM. And I was worried about the security implications uh, very naturally. Uh, but I think in retrospect, that was a mistake. I think that if IPFS and VA had shipped together from the get-go, kind of what did, um, the whole kind of history here would have been very different because I feel the and all the data structures would have just been um, uh, written directly and, and run on VA uh, naturally. But anyway, uh, I think the, the big thing that's gonna um, open things up here is that I think where we're headed is that IPFS is not gonna be a single kind of like binary or tool that you run separately or like you, you treat a, an IPFS implementation as a different system that, that you're gonna run and so on. But really it's a way of, kind of programming your application and your system by using a lot of these components as libraries and, and really put, push a lot of the complexity of the network stack and a lot of the protocols, so things like BitSwap and the transports and BitSwap graph sync and many other transports, and um, a, a lot of the complexity of um, and power really of IPLD and the ADLs and so on um, into into Wasm. And so I think like the, the the big one of the big things that, that I think is going to matter here is to get to a point where we can start embedding um, Wasm programs with uh, a lot of the different kinds of IPFS implementations. And so this is what I think uh, where we're headed sort of this year. Um, I think it would be great at, as a community to kind of talk about all, all this sort of stuff in in, um, in IPFS camp. Now, um, I wanna kind of like touch on a few things that I think are gonna be really important to uh, people writing IPFS implementations today and people potentially starting new ones. Because uh, there's a lot of people, today we've heard about tons of different implementations, which is super, um, A, we should kind of like support all those groups um, and B, we should uh, help make it way easier to do all of that work and all that development. And so we should kind of like, I, I think it would be great if at IPFS camp we can, or even before, we can look back and kind of like make problems easier by um, dismissing a lot of um, requirements or constraints uh, to kind of like be a full on, um, you know, kind of IPFS implementation or, or to have an IPFS deployment or an IPFS system. Um, and the kind of like litmus test that, I, that I've been using lately is like, hey, if you have, a program that represents IPLD data with CIDs and so on, and you're and it just moves it around with Netcat uh, to some other program somewhere else. Like, is that an IPFS system? And I think it probably is. Um, I think that there's one key constraint here that I think our community is going to have to figure out. And um, I have a strong opinion on this, but I don't really have a good answer. Is like whether or not you know content should be findable and writable. And that will really matter. I'll hop into kind of thinking about networks in a, in a moment and thinking about primitives and kind of what are the things that have, that I think are going to stand the test of time. But um, before I get to that, I, in terms of making it easy, I think one of the key things that our community needs to do is to have a strong focus on optimizing performance. And one of the pieces here is like, if, if you look at large scale systems, like the web that we use today, um, all browsers, all, um, large scale deployments of, of, of complex software and so on, um, they have extensive um, uh, testing frameworks. And here, um, one of the principles that all of that is based on is at the end of the day, like you, you really get what you measure. And if you're not measuring something, you're not gonna get a good, a, a good signal and you're not gonna get the outcome that, you, that you're expecting. So in terms of like, really building, it's uh, kind of like leveling up the success of the implementations everywhere. We need to shift to a mode where we're learning from the best in class, large scale distributed system um, uh, communities and get to a point where we can really optimize and, the, and, and measure, the perform measure the performance of all of these different kinds of implementations and get to a point where we can start optimizing all of them. And this is like a huge undertaking to kind of build the tooling and the and the structures to be able to support this. Uh, we already have a lot of this kind of stuff in the past. Like we built out things like TestGround. TestGround, it, it really enables um, 
a lot of this kind of testing and tons of improvements have come out of this. Um, we've done a lot of R&D to, um, to find problems uh, and kind of turn it into like measurable um, outcomes, kind of fix problems. Like there's a really great talk from uh, ProBlab talking about a bunch of different questions and in, in, in I think that's to uh, kind of solve problems and, and whatnot. Uh, but I think basically like we have to level up the community oriented infrastructure to get to something like this where like it's super easy to write performance oriented benchmarks that then can um, you can kind of tie to an implementation and you can see the changes that you're going to make uh, and how they're going to ripple through um, kind of like our, all, all our users. And I think because we're lacking something like this, um, a lot of problems sneak in and it's difficult to kind of evolve the software. Uh, when you think about uh, systems like you know, most of the programming languages that we use or um, browsers and so on, we have cases of thousands or tens of thousands of people working daily on improving those systems. And the only way that you can manage a system, a software system at that scale and keep good performance, don't like don't break the things that matter and so on, is by getting to this kind of super robust um, uh, performance and optimization structure. So one of the big things that, that I think as a community we need to do is to get to this this kind of point where we can we have this kind of um, uh, large scale testing and tooling, and and so this is like a a, a, a key component. Um, I want to kind of like talk for a moment about like important primitives. So I think um, something that I that, that I think has stood the test of time like really well is CIDs. Uh, I think they've turned out to be really useful uh, in a ton of ways. Um, I've, I've seen them even absorbed into systems that. Um, don't use um, IPLD or, or any, fully, but, and, and so by nature they're sort of like bringing in IPLD. Uh, but the point is, like, they have turned out to be like a pretty, pretty useful, uh, useful component and primitive. And so things, tools that kind of um, use CIDs, I think will will very much stand the test of time. Um, I think getting right now today, we all understand the power and utility of being able to manipulate the, these DAGs directly. Um, but today it's still like very difficult to write your own data structures. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of evolve them and make them work across systems. And a big part of that is that we don't have a good language for expressing these in a, in a language and runtime independent way. So for example, if you write some complex data structure, you have to go and implement it in a bunch of different languages for it to be uh, to be used, or um, you're gonna have to like um, have a bunch of systems that, that don't know how to deal with it um, opaque and, and it can't like do translation in the gateway or anything like that. So I think one of the key things here is to shift to a mode where we can properly program all of these kinds of um, data structures in a way that all program all IPFS capable systems can can interpret. And I think that one of the, the key to that is IPLD. Um, sorry, sorry. The key to that is Wasm. Is bringing in Wasm into into the equation to then be able to have all link all of the um, link all of the codecs and so on to be able to kind of interpret the um, all of these data structures. Um, I think another really great um, uh, thing that, I, that that's just kind of like helped ease the the problem is these car files, and we, they've all evolved quite a bit, and I think they're going to continue evolving. Um, but just this idea that you can like take a bunch of data, bundle it into a car file, and then move that around um, has just been super useful. And so I would expect to see a lot more um, implementations over time uh, just using car files directly. And this is a pretty good format to bet on. Um, uh, because of it's kind of like broad, broad flexibility. You can think of um, having implementations that don't have a repo; they just kind of like point to a car file, or they uh, point to you know some other tool uh, written around or on top of multiple car files and whatnot. Uh, it's also what's going to enable kind of swapping you know whole libraries of content in and out and, and being able to kind of move them around. So if you kind of write a bunch of car files into a into a um, drive somewhere, you can like take that drive out and uh, move it somewhere else. So I think like th this is it, it's a pretty good format to bet on. Um, and especially because there's like good thought put into the upgrades to that this format. So as more and more, more features uh, emerge, so like the, the new um, car V2 and car V3 and so on that, that might come uh, down the, the pipeline, um, they're built with uh, very much backwards compatibility in mind so that you can kind of reason about them. Uh, one of the things I think is key for, for folks to to remember remember is that there's, and I need kind of like a much better diagram of this because this is like super outdated, this is from like many years ago. Um, is that the broader IPFS network is a very large scale um, thing spanning the internet and potentially disconnected. So you have many different kinds of systems uh, loading and using data 
in disconnected environments that may or may not be using the DHT, may or may not be using the new um, uh, network indexers, um, and the content may not be like directly writable or findable. But you want to be able to like write tools and systems to be able to move around uh, a lot of this data across these these kinds of networks. So kind of like have this picture in mind where um, you know if your if your tool is putting in an assumption that some service is going to be around, then um, maybe it only works in in you know a subset of the subset of the network. One thing I want to touch on is just kind of a a sense of scale of where where we are now and and sort of like where we're headed. Um, I remember probably two three years ago, probably three years ago, uh, there was a large effort around um, package managers and putting in a lot of data for package managers um, using QuietFS and so on. And at the time, it, like we were having trouble with like you know one terabyte of content and just loading one single terabyte into um, into Google IPFS or dealing with like a repo of that size uh, was kind of difficult, and um, it's kind of complex to deal with like that kind of that kind of um, sets of uh, static assets and whatnot. And and today, like we are just kind of like in a in a totally different world. Um, let me show you like a thing of to get a sense of scale. You know, one of the, the largest um, IPFS deployments is the Falcon Network, and just as a sense, like the Falcon Network is onboarding. I guess today it's um, there's like I think about 80 petabytes of data total. It's like this in, in, insane level of scale compared to where we were um, two years ago or three years ago. I would encourage people to like write implementations and tools that are going to be able to deal with this kind of scale, with this kind of like magnitude of data. And this is like really stressing a lot of our our assumptions about systems. So for example, um, just how we how we think about absorbing some large scale data set that's maybe stored in a ton of drives, and then we have to process it to turn it all into IPLD data. And that right now today requires like reading all that data, copying it and splitting it up into, into a number of uh, car files, all with these different like little graphs. Um, and we can't really like have a way of kind of mapping onto um, the drive as it is now. Um, and kind of re being able to sort of like ingest the drive and construct like a, a set of companion indices or something that can point to the data. Like we're, we're dealing with a scale of like a, a, of data ingestion now where um, it is really questioning a lot of the assumptions that, that a lot of the IPFS tooling built over the last um, three, four years kind of um, had. And so I think like use this as a like massive opportunity to say, um, Hey, could we like rethink how data onboarding into a content address network should work? Like, could we do a thing where like you can run a pro you can take a drive with like terabytes worth of stuff, and you know remember that like um, the storage density is gonna keep increasing. Like we're gonna we have like I think eight ten terabyte drives now, sixteen terabyte drives. Um, it's gonna push into twenty and more in the future, and so a lot of the data in the world is gonna be like already stored in a specific set of formats. Can we lean into that? And write tools that can just index the data on the drive as they are on whatever uh, native file system format that drive is in, and then add a content addressing layer on top of it. So you can just kind of use the drive as it is, um, and and just plug it into to a set of IPFS nodes or IPFS systems that can like read that data and use that data. So I think like um, you know some implementations looking at this problem scale and being able to tune their uh, tooling for this, I think, will be will be super helpful. Um, one other thing that this brings up is that all of that data right now, a lot of it is just standard UnixFS data imported into into um, into the network. It's not kind of like IPLD fied in any kind of special way. Uh, some of it is, but but most of it is not. And that means like there's probably some other ways of importing this data or making it broadly usable that that really go into kind of how do you how should you import this? Or instead of importing, in that moment of importing, how do you create handles for that data already at rest in some structure and provide an, another secondary index over it? Like you could create a bunch of intermediate um, set of nodes and so on that point to existing data as it is, stored as it is, and then give you a different handle and way of accessing it, right? So you could have a, a lot of stuff added already as standard Unix files, Unix FS files in a Unix FS DAG. And you can construct another DAG that points to the objects in that DAG 
and interprets it differently. And one of the key things that enables that is all the IPLD um, data layouts and so on. Um, but again, for that, we, we're going to need um, to make the entire thing programmable. And so we're going to need WASM, um, WASM everywhere. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm I, reaching the, the end of the, um, the talk. So I want to kind of finish up talking about like two things. Um, one is we're going to, we, what we're talking about here today through, through pointing out different possibilities and different implementations and so on is a, is a huge amount of work. And part of that requires um, helping create and build and, and support a lot of these, these implementations. Uh, so one of the things that I've been talking to a number of people about is actually creating a fund to um, support people writing uh, new IPFS implementations. So one of the things that I'm working on in the in, in uh, with some folks is um, uh, creating a set of um, like a, like a large scale funder of a bunch of different implementations. Um, and, and I'll have I hope to have more news about this in the in the weeks leading up to IPFS camp. But the goal would be to kind of like be able to support a number of teams um, writing different kinds of IPFS implementations and different kinds of IPFS tooling uh, to then go and tackle a lot of these large scale problems. So that's one, one of the things there is um, trying to kind of uh, leverage a lot of the um, community oriented funding structures that have emerged in the, um, in the Web3 community to then allocate funding to teams building a bunch of this tooling in a lot of these implementations uh, without kind of like, uh, uh, inserting a whole other talk in, in this one about kind of like what's been going on there. Um, I'll just kind of like leave it at that and, and say more maybe at, at, at IPFS camp. Um, the, the second thing is about IPFS camp. I think the, a lot of us kind of like see the need for this happening uh, relatively soon. Um, and I think we're kind of now at the, at the point where um, we have a, a very large scale uh, community that kind of wants this to, to happen soon. Um, Kind of like the original kind of a goal for this was to kind of bring together a, a subset of the community in July. Um, there's all kinds of like um, requirements and so on that are shifting that over to September. So as I said on chat, I think it would be great to get input from the people in this room because kind of what we want to do is like gather together the set of people that are here now um, to uh, talk about this. So I would love to kind of like, so, so if you're here in this call, just kind of, um, if you want to get together and talk about all this, this sort of stuff, soon, like in kind of like a July timeframe, uh, let me know here on chat uh, and that'll be useful. Like if you can sort of um, commit to come together and like go, go do this, like this would be really useful data for me. Um, and separate, if if you want to kind of, um, hey, no, actually it would be much more, much better for us to kind of push out to uh, to September and kind of like work towards that and, and work towards like having that, that um, a much larger uh, community uh, gathering uh, at that point, uh, also let me know that. So like, uh, just quick poll to the people hearing this. Um, what what uh, do you do? You feel the same kind of urgency that a lot of the people in this call have to get together, define a lot of these things, and kind of do this work uh, sooner? Or would now, having heard this and having digested this, want more time to kind of reason about it more, and then kind of do a much larger thing with a much larger um, community in uh, later on in the year? So uh, just say it now in in your in your uh, on chat. I think it'll be very useful.